panelists, just a quick reminder to please turn off your video when you're not speaking. The moderator will invite you to the floor and that will be your cue to please turn on your video. Thank you, Leila. Good evening to all joining us today uh, in this final session of the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition's dialogue. I'm sure there are others who are joining us early morning their time, uh, like our colleagues at Femnet who are connecting from Nairobi. So good morning to you. We have other colleagues co uh, connecting from India. Good morning to all of you. My name is Venge Nyirongo, thematic lead for the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights at UN Women. Distinguished participants, I have the pleasure of being your MC today and would first of all like to welcome you all to this very exciting session with wonderful speakers, panelists, and a great moderator. Before we start, I would like to mention just a few things about our technology today. In front of your screens, you will see a Q and A button, um, which you can actually use throughout the session today to ask questions to our speakers today. You will also see a little globe feature next to the Q and A function, which you can click uh, to tune into your language of choice. The session today will be conducted in Arabic, English, French, and Spanish. Now, dear participants, I'd like to take you through the agenda of the day. We will start with a quick overview of the Action Coalition's journey, which is going to be done by Sarah Hendricks, who is the director of the Program Policy and Intergovernmental Division at UN Women. Ms. Hendricks is also co-lead of the Action Coalition Secretariat. We will then welcome UN Women's Deputy Executive Director, Ms. Anita Batia who will give us welcome remarks. After this, we will move into the substantive part of the session, uh, which will be a series of moderated panels with um, seven leaders of the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights. Mm -hmm. Dear participants, these leaders are this morning represented by a youth-led organization, uh, civil society, philanthropic, uh, uh, um, sorry, a private sector organization, uh, a government and an international organization uh, who are all here to show us how a multi-stakeholder collaboration for gender equality really works. Mm -hmm. If you want to know who they really are, uh, they are the government of Mexico, uh, CARE International, the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development, uh, Femnet, ANYA, UNCDF, which is the Capital Development Fund of the United Nations, and PayPal. These panels will be moderated by a dear colleague of mine, Ms. Simi Kayum, who is OIC for Economic Empowerment at UN Women. Simi will introduce the panels accordingly um, as their turns come up. After our panels, we will uh, move uh, to close this session. However, I just wanted to share with you that there are three additional features that will ensure more information is shared throughout the session and enable our participation. The first is we will have a video that will amplify the voices of women from around the world. And then we will have a question and answer session after our panels are done. Finally, we will conduct uh, a poll which you will all be uh, able to contribute to. Dear participants, allow me now to invite Ms. Sarah Hendricks to the stage Please turn on your video, Sarah, uh, and you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benge, and thank you to all of you for being here in today's session on the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights. I'm absolutely thrilled to be with all of you today and to join you as leaders and future commitment makers in this important milestone in the journey of the Action Coalitions here at the Mexico City Generation Equality Forum. I'd love to share with you 
a bit about the journey so far in advancing the Generation Equality Action Coalitions. And just taking us back in our minds to how the Action Coalitions emerged. The Action Coalitions have been launched through following really a very focused fact, which is that 26 years after the Beijing Platform for Action, not a single country has achieved gender equality to date. And indeed, there is a pressing need to go from words to real, funded, and game-changing action. 26 years after women from all over the world gathered in Beijing and promises for gender equality were made, we know that much more is needed to really realize that ambition in concrete ways. And I think the year 2020, which was intended to be the 25th anniversary of Beijing, the celebration of progress and the recognition of critical advancement needed, COVID-19 entered that discourse to cause us all to pause, to pause and to recognize the urgency as well as the criticality of our focus on gender equality at this moment, at this moment where COVID-19 is exacerbating inequalities, where we're seeing a deepening of women's poverty, where we're seeing predictions for women's economic lives being particularly impacted. And so the Action Coalitions as a global, multi-stakeholder and innovative platform really stands poised poised to build a more equal and to catalyze a more inclusive and sustainable world with gender equality at its heart and as the engine of building back differently and building back better. The ambition of the Action Coalitions is um, tremendous and you can see some of this journey on the slide in front of you. It has been to date a dynamic journey and a journey that will continue forward from Mexico. The journey started almost two years ago with a decision made by the governments of Mexico, France, UN Women, and partners across civil society and youth-led organizations to mark that anniversary of Beijing by the launch of an action-driven effort. And so the Generation Equality Action Coalitions have and are seeking to really bring partners together, governments, women's, feminist, as well as youth-led organizations international organizations, philanthropy, and the private sector, fundamentally to catalyze collective action, spark both global and local conversations across generations, and drive necessary public and private investment to really advance concrete progress on gender equality across generations for women and girls. And so as you see in the slide, six themes were identified early in 2020, after rigorous consultations, after dialogue, as well as as a result of evidence-based analysis. These themes included, importantly, the theme of economic justice and rights. And 95 leaders following the selection of these themes were brought together after a, a, a call that went out with more than 2,000 letters of intent received, these 95 leaders represent diverse, vibrant, inclusive, and youth-centric voices and perspectives into the leadership of these action coalitions. And you will meet many of the leaders of the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights today. These leaders have been working together um, to build a bold and transformative blueprint a draft blueprint, a blueprint that others can contribute, including through today's dialogue session, your perspective to shape further. That blueprint has indeed been the result of design sprint workshops, of action coalition meetings, and dialogue sessions of a highly dynamic, interactive, and dialogical process to identify four game-changing actions and a concrete blueprint for change. Each blueprint articulates an ambitious agenda 
that will accelerate progress in this UN decade of action. And in this light, I think the Generation Equality Action Coalitions are an extraordinary platform, both in their approach as well as in their level of ambition. These leaders who have come together to build fundamentally an acceleration plan on key areas that matter to women and girls' lives that will accelerate and leapfrog us forward towards the SDGs. The blueprint on, on the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights will address crucial challenges faced by women and girls. And you'll hear about those today, including around transforming the care economy, formal and decent employment, including both in the formal and informal economies, access and control of productive resources, as well as promoting the gender transformation of economies and fiscal stimulus. It will be important for all of our voices to come together to further build out these blueprints, to further enhance the impact of this effort altogether. And so we will be talking today about the opportunity to join, to join as commitment makers in this bold and groundbreaking effort. And so with these notes of our journey that we've been on to date and to kick off this conversation today, I'd now like to invite Anita Bhatia to the floor. Anita is the Deputy Executive Director for Resource Management, Sustainability and Partnerships for UN Women. And I'm delighted that Anita will present us with some opening remarks. Over to you, Anita. Thank you so much, Sarah. And a hearty congratulations to you and Hannah for all of the work that you, along with the partners you mentioned, have done to get us to this point uh, in the generation equality process. Hats off to all of you. And I'd like to start by just saying a warm welcome to all those who are joining us today from different parts of the world. Good evening. Perhaps it's good morning for some of you. Really nice to be with you here uh, right now. Uh, I also want to thank the governments of Mexico and France for their leadership and stewardship of the generation equality process. Without your stewardship and your partnership, we would not be here today. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Sarah, you did a really nice job of laying out the journey that you and other partners have been engaged in to craft the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights and to do the hard work of coming up with the blueprints, which will form really a business plan for the world on economic justice for women. And you pointed out, Sarah, uh, some of the reasons why this work is more important today than ever before. But let me just add a few reflections of mine to the very many interesting thoughts that you shared with us. First, we are really at an inflection point because of the opportunity to review 26 years of progress since Beijing, but also because of the profound fundamental and disquieting effects of the pandemic on women's lives. We have seen that this impact, which was disproportionate and continues to be disproportionately negative for women, has manifested itself in three ways, in impacts on income, impact on health and in impact on security. Income, because many of the sectors that were hit by the pandemic when it first broke out are sectors which are heavily feminized, retail, tourism, domestic work, and others. We also saw a very large number of women carrying the world on their shoulders as caregivers during the pandemic, as frontline workers, as nurses, and as caregivers both in the medical sector and at home. The other impact and, uh, that we saw during the pandemic was on women's health. And this matters for their economic contribution and their economic uh, autonomy. Health services changed during the pandemic and access to life-saving reproductive services, contraceptive services were disadvantaged because governments appropriately pivoted to handling the public health crisis. And third, we saw uh, a huge spike in violence against women, which we at UN Women 
and the Secretary General have called the shadow pandemic of violence against women. I mention these impacts because without thinking about these impacts, it is impossible to think about solutions to these impacts. And these impacts all have economic consequences. All have economic consequences. We saw two other things in the pandemic that we had not seen quite as clearly before. First, we saw that the world is divided into those women who have care responsibilities and those who don't. The burden of care, which we had always known to be, to be much higher for women than for men, three times higher for women than for men pre-pandemic, shot up exponentially as well. And second, we saw that the world is divided into those who have digital access and those who don't. Solving for this will be critical if indeed we are to ensure women's e economic autonomy and rights in the post-pandemic world. That is why I would like to congratulate those who have been partners in this action coalition, because by emphasizing the need for women to have decent work, both in the formal and informal sector, by emphasizing the need for women to have access to and control over their own resources, and by emphasizing the need to have more inclusive and just economies, you have in fact identified some of the key elements of change. In conclusion, let me say that current economic models and systems do not work well for women. They do not work well for women in most parts of the world. And that is why there is a need to fundamentally rewrite the rules of the game. We have already seen that a one-time event like the pandemic can have impacts that will have long-term consequences. And although employment is a lagging indicator, we already know that there has been a profound impact on female labor force participation because of the pandemic, and that female labor force participation may never come back to its pre-pandemic levels in some countries. This is not only disturbing, it is dangerous for the health of society and for the size of GDPs and for the health of a society. So we must act, but we must act with a vision that refuses to accept the current state of play that is bold, transformational, and seeks to change the system. This is not easy work, and I want to commend all of you for the hard work that you have done to get to this point and to wish you the very best in your journey as you embark on this next crucial step of fleshing out the blueprints and fleshing out the commitments that will make those blueprints come to life. Thank you so much, Venge and Simon, for the work that you're going to do to moderate today's discussion. I'm sure it will be fantastic. I want to thank all the partners who are joining us today and I very much look forward to hearing about the results of your discussions. Thank you so much and back to you, Venge. Thank you so much, Deputy Executive Director. It's always inspiring to just hear you share the fruits of your professional experience, your words of wisdom and your leadership. Yeah. You've set the scene for our discussion today by highlighting the great work that remains to be done on gender equality and women's and girls' economic empowerment all the world over and our opportunity to change the narrative and history and the roles that we all need to play uh, need to be very clearly defined. Thank you very much, Deputy Executive Director Batia. I now would like to welcome Simi to the stage to take us through the moderated panel discussions. Simi, please turn on your video to take the floor. The mic is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Venge. It is an honor indeed to moderate this session. We will hear from leaders of the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights throughout this session. And as uh, I invite the speakers um, to take the floor, I would like to remind you to please turn on your um, video and your microphone um, before you speak. Thank you so much. I'd now like to welcome Ms. Sofia Sprechman-Sinerio, Secretary General for Care International. 
Care International is one of the 16 leaders of the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition. Ms. Spreckman, I would like to invite you to tell us a bit more about this action coalition. May I ask you, why must we focus on economic justice and rights for women and girls? Why is it urgent now? And what does the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights aspire to achieve in five years time? Ms. Spreckman, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting CARE to this very distinguished panel. I'm delighted to be here on behalf of CARE as one of the co-leads of the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and, and Rights. The Mexico Generation Equality Forum comes at the most crucial time to reinvigorate global ambition for gender equality. We are in the midst of a devastating global pandemic that has, as we all know, exacerbated inequalities and reversed development progress by 25 years. And yet alongside this, we have witnessed backtracking on key commitments on women's and girls' justice and rights in recent fora. These two realities do not go together. We cannot, must not let this happen if we want to call ourselves feminists and visionaries for a just and better post-pandemic world. I have been invited to kick off this panel discussion by setting the scene and making the case for women's and girls' economic justice and rights. I will briefly describe why we need to act now and how the Action Coalition can help achieve gender equitable economies by 2025. This is an exciting task. The Generation Equality Forum and Action Coalition hold so much opportunity and potential. I do hope that at the end of this inspiring discussion, we will leave in confidence with increased ambition and joint commitment to making economic justice and rights a reality for every woman and every girl. So let me start with why we need to act now. We are all aware that we are facing an urgent challenge due to the catastrophic impacts of COVID on women and girls. CARE conducted rapid gender analysis across 40 countries since March 2020. We spoke to more than 6,000 women and analyzed sex and age disaggregated data that tell us how the pandemic is impacting men and women, girls and boys. And data confirms what we all know that COVID is widening and deepening systemic inequalities and having catastrophic impacts across multiple dimensions of women and girls' lives, including on their economic justice and rights. Globally, women are 1.8 times more likely to have lost their jobs since the beginning of the pandemic. And women and girls have seen an increase of 30 to 40% to an already inequitable unpaid care burden. They're caring for sick family members, children, the elderly. Yet current political action and COVID-19 responses are falling short, or if I may say, even reversing women's and girls' opportunities and rights. Inequalities are growing. The Action Coalition provides the right space and has the mandate to turn the stakes once and for all. So let's explore how. Uh, my uh, Action Coalition colleagues will shortly provide further detail and discuss the coalition's vision and priorities. I'm encouraged to know the joint commitments on building the care economy, advancing decent work, fostering women's financial inclusion and business opportunities, and building gender just macroeconomic systems. But allow me to make to outline five critical steps on how to advance women's and girls' economic justice and rights and to build forward from COVID. From, from the work uh, that we have carried out at CARE with, of course, thousands of partners. So the first step, a critical first step, we must rigorously prioritize gender equality throughout response and recovery strategies. This means including women and girls in decision-making and leadership positions and investing in local women-led and women's rights organization, which often focus on supporting the most vulnerable and provide essential but under-resourced services that are critical if women and girls are to recover from crisis. Second, we must promote proactive labor market policies that create jobs, protect labor rights, and ensure safety in the workplace. Special consideration must go to tackling sexual harassment at work. 
governments should urgently ratify, resource and implement the International Labour Organization's Violence and Harassment Convention, Convention 190. This is absolutely critical. In fact, our, our work in Southeast Asia shows that violence against women and girls has significantly increased. In Vietnam, for instance, nearly 20% of female workers have experienced violence and harassment in the workplace in the last six months. And the rate of domestic violence against women has almost doubled since the beginning of COVID. Currently, one country out of three does not have any legislation that explicitly prohibits sexual harassment and violence at work. The ratification and application at national level of ILO Convention 190 is critical to protect workers in the formal and informal econ economy and in domestic settings and online as well, of course. Third, a third important how, we must ensure social protection and safety nets during times of crisis, including for informal workers. In our rapid gender analysis in the LAC, in the Latin American and Caribbean region, uh, it, those analyses have shown that COVID-19 poses a serious threat to women's engagement in economic activities and particularly impacts women, girls, LGBTIQ plus people, especially those from marginalized groups such as indigenous and Afro-descendant communities, rural, migrant and refugee communities and workers in informal or precarious employment. Over 126 million women work in the informal sector without access to social protection. The Action Coalition needs to work towards universal social protection that encompasses all women and groups facing intersecting discrimination. Fourth, a fourth critical how, we must accelerate women's financial inclusion and business opportunities, including through collectives and savings groups. Women's access to financial resources has been hit hard by the pandemic when savings and access to credit is the number one coping mechanism during crisis. Yet saving groups have provided an anchor through informal safety nets. In Niger, for instance, 76% of groups found ways to use their social funds to help members cope with the crisis. These experiences show the group's resilience and ability to adapt and the importance of these groups for their communities. So as part of the Action Co Coalition priorities in financial inclusion and social protection, it is important to complement with strengthening informal networks such as saving groups and Fifth, a fifth important how, decision makers must urgently correct against the inequitable unpaid care burden. This requires investing in care and social services while also fostering the recognition, reduction, redistribution of unpaid care work, for example, by providing affordable and accessible childcare services, parental leave, flexible working and other family friendly work policies. Finally, I would like to re-emphasize the importance of inclusion, transformative change and gender justice as part of this process. The vision statement for the Action Coalition commits us to achieving Beijing's vision of economic justice and rights for every woman and girl, including those facing intersecting discrimination, whilst also strengthening women's leadership and holding decision makers to account, all of which is welcome. And achieving women's and girls' economic justice and rights requires also just and inclusive, inclusive processes. Given the unequal power dynamics and historical injustice many civil society actors have experienced to date, sitting at the negotiating table with other stakeholders is not always easy. But all the Action Coalition leaders have made the conscious decision that we can't do this alone we must listen to each other and forge new relationships based on feminist principles and gender equality. And most important of all, we aim for the stars. Our levels of ambition must match the scale of the challenges we have to overcome. And this is why CARE has put up our hand to help lead the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition and why we are so excited to build new partnerships. And finally, we will need to act now. We have come together here 
with shared will to work on the vision of Beijing. Let us do that and start now and build sustainable, feminist, people-centered, and just economist, economies, economias sostenibles, feministas y justas. CARE stands ready to play our part and work together. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Spreckman, for those very cogent and illuminating remarks. Thank you. Um, I would now like to invite four other leaders from the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition to take the floor. Please, please do turn on your videos and your mics. The four speakers on this panel are Ms. Memory Kachambawa, Executive Director for Femnet, Dr. Anna Barbara Mungare Moctezuma, Head of the Productive Development Unit of the Ministry of Economy of Mexico, Ms. Rosita Najmi, Head of the Global Social Innovation for PayPal, and Ms. Emilia Reyes, Co Convener for the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development. I would like to ask each of our distinguished panelists to speak about achieving the ambitious vision of the Action Coalition through four action areas. Our panelists represent different perspectives within the Action Coalition, from philanthropy, from government, from international organizations, from civil society organizations. What role can each play in achieving the goal of the Action Coalition? That those are the questions that we have for you. And I would ask you to please keep your remarks to five minutes um, in the interest of making it through our very packed agenda this evening or this morning. So um, Ms. Um, Kachamba, please speak on the first action area, uh, the care economy. You have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Simon, and it's really great to be here. I think following on what uh, Sophia said about the need to increase uh, investment, um, women's economic empowerment by transforming the care economy. So as action coalition leaders, um, our proposal is that by 2026, there's increase in the number of countries with a comprehensive set of measures so this includes three investments in gender responsive, public and private quality care services, which are very important. Um, issues to do with law policy reforms, as well as the creation of 80 million decent jobs. And this is for the five R's to recognize, to reduce, to redistribute and care and paid care work and reward and represent care workers while guaranteeing their labor rights. So this also contributes to SDG um, 5 and the indicator 5.4.1. And under this um, action, we identified three tactics. Uh, and these are just strategies for action that will advance this ambitious goal. The first one is on reforming and implementing national laws and I just want to add that this also includes um, family laws, um, in reforming also workplace policies to guarantee decent work for care and domestic workers, to also increase pay for paid care workers and increase their representation and participation in policy making. Uh, the second tactic is to quantify the contribution of care work to the economy, as well as integrating care and domestic work in private sector policies and infrastructure and national planning framework as well. And the last tactics is really on increasing national budgets uh, to at least three to 10% of national income for equitable quality public care services and increasing public investment in essential social services and universal social protection schemes. So this also includes um, private sector investment as well as reforms and commitments. Thank you. And back to you, Simen. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Kachamba. And now I would like to invite um, Dr. Mungarai to speak on decent work. You have the floor. 
you very much. Buenas noches. Agradezco al Secretariado de la Coalición, a ONU Mujeres y a Mujeres, así como a las organizaciones internacionales, empresas, sociedad civil y estados líderes de la coalición por estar acá ahora. La justicia y los derechos económicos afectan a todas las mujeres y niñas en todo el mundo. En el mejor de los casos, el progreso hacia este tema se ha estancado. Persisten aún las brechas de género en la inclusión financiera y dentro de la fuerza laboral remunerada y las mujeres están sobre representadas en empleos informales, precarios y vulnerables. Por lo tanto, la coalición de acción por la justicia y los derechos económicos tiene como objetivo crear un entorno jurídico y normativo propicio e involucrar a las mujeres en la expansión del trabajo decente en la economía formal e informal a fin de reducir el número de mujeres trabajadoras que viven en la pobreza para 2026, contribuyendo así al ODS 1 y 8 y a los indicadores 1.1.1 y 8.5 de los ODS. ¿Qué necesita cambiar? Las limitaciones críticas para la realización de la justicia económica y los derechos para todos radican en el hecho de que el sistema económico actual no funciona para las mujeres y las niñas. La pandemia COVID-19 está exponiendo aún más las vulnerabilidades en los sistemas sociales, políticos y económicos. Ha hecho claramente visible el hecho de que las economías formales del mundo y el mantenimiento de nuestra vida diaria se basan en el trabajo invisible y no remunerado de mujeres y niñas. Con los niños sin escolarizar, la intensificación de las necesidades de atención de las personas mayores y los miembros de la familia enfermos y los servicios de salud abrumados, las demandas de trabajo de cuidado en un mundo COVID-19 se han intensificado exponencialmente. Las mujeres ocupan la mayoría de los puestos de trabajo en los sectores económicos más afectados, tienen más probabilidades de perder sus puestos de trabajo en comparación con los hombres y están sobre representadas en la primera línea como el 70% de la fuerza laboral de la salud mundial. Sin acción, la pandemia representa la amenaza real de retroceder en los modestos avances logrados en las últimas décadas. En este contexto hemos identificado cinco estrategias de acción que harán avanzar este ambicioso objetivo. El primero es eliminar la legislación y las políticas discriminatorias por motivos de género y ampliar las acciones afirmativas en materia de género para aumentar considerablemente el acceso de las mujeres al trabajo decente, los medios de vida y las oportunidades empresariales. En segundo lugar, financiar y fortalecer las capacidades de los grupos de mujeres para forjar y defender el programa de trabajo decente para mejorar su seguridad económica. Además, ampliar las prácticas empresariales y públicas para aumentar el trabajo decente para las mujeres en el mercado laboral, garantizar la voz, la representación y el liderazgo de las mujeres. En cuarto lugar, aumentar la financiación para la creación de empleo decente y la infraestructura y los servicios de trabajo decente en los mercados laborales del sector formal e informal. Y por último, aumentar la inversión en la educación de las adolescentes y mujeres jóvenes y su formación profesional para mejorar las habilidades esenciales para el trabajo crítico futuro, teniendo en cuenta las necesidades específicas de las personas en contextos vulnerables. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Mungaray. I would now like to invite um, Ms. Uh, Najmi uh, to speak on productive resources. Ms. Najmi, you have the floor. Thank you, Samin. I'd like to thank the team within the Mexican government and UN Women who work to organize this seminal forum. I'm excited to share the action statement for the Productive Resources sub-theme. Together, we must act to expand women's access to and control over productive resources through increasing access to and control over land, gender responsive financial products and services, and the number of firms owned by women by 2026. 
Under this action, we've identified three strategies to advance this ambitious goal. First, we must eliminate gender discriminatory policies, adopt and implement laws and ensure strategies and investments are underway that realize women and girls access to and control over productive resources and assets. Second, we must support platforms representing women's groups and scale infrastructure that measurably expands women's access to and use of productive resources, including affordable capital, financial services, digital products, internet, energy, and equitable access to government and service and benefits. And third, we must identify and challenge harmful social norms, stereotypes, and practices impeding women and girls from equitably controlling and benefiting from productive resources while fostering positive attitudes, validating women's empowerment and economic contributions. I really wanna emphasize the unique and far-reaching impact of the digital opportunity. Gender intentional investments in digital payments and ID infrastructure are key to building forward differently, more inclusive, resilient, and gender intentional financial systems. Digital payments help women manage time poverty. Digital payments give women agency. Digital payments provide privacy and increased safety than cash. And in terms of the opportunity of the private sector um, and the role that it can play, I'd like to answer that in two ways. One is three general ideas. And second are some lessons learned that PayPal has had to help illuminate these ideas as well as link to some specific recommended actions from the economic justice and Rights Action Coalition. So the three ideas, closing the access gap, bolstering women-owned businesses, thinking beyond financial capital. Access to digital payments, products, and services provides previously excluded women with a critical link to the formal economy and a gateway to greater economic security and personal empowerment. We can reduce the current 9% access gap by creating demand-driven financial products and services strengthening usage and generating an enabling legal and policy environment. We can build on digital forms of entrepreneurship and financial inclusion to further reduce women's barriers to financial access and business creation, including through alternative forms of credit history to access that critical startup and working capital. And we can think beyond financial capital. Private sector players can leverage other types of capital to help women businesses grow network capital, human capital, intellectual capital, and even reputation capital. In terms of PayPal's lessons learned, three that I'll offer are linked to the action on transforming the care economy. Lesson one, pay equity will contribute to issues of care economy and inform how time is valued and compared in households. PayPal is extremely proud to have achieved gender pay equity globally and ethnic pay equity in the US for the fifth year in a row. Lesson two, everyone gains when we provide employees with resources they need directly and via policy changes. PayPal joined a coalition advocating for the passage of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and have been recognized by the National Partnership for Women and Families for our leave policies. Lesson three, we need intentional policies aimed at keeping women in the workforce. At PayPal, we understand the direct correlations strong family leave policies have with keeping women in the workforce. And in response to COVID-19, for instance, the company rolled out benefit enhancements as it relates to time off, leave, and family, including a crisis leave benefit that provided additional paid time off. Lesson four, supply side and demand side informal barriers to women's access to usage must be dismantled. There's lots of work to be done on informal barriers, especially social and cultural norms. One way to start is to celebrate and show what's possible when they're overcome. For example, PayPal has taken a number of actions to underscore its support of vulnerable businesses, including a $535 million commitment to support Black and underrepresented businesses and communities. As part of this initiative, we introduced just earlier this month the Maggie Lena Walker Award, named for the black business leader, teacher and civil rights activist who was the first black woman to charter and run a US bank. The honor will recognize and elevate the achievements of underrepresented women in business who have demonstrated a deep commitment to empowering those in their communities. And the final lesson learned, expanding decent work and employment in informal and informal economies. 
the private sector can improve market access. As a result of a recent partnership with Flutterwave, African merchants can now connect with more than 300 million PayPal accounts globally and overcome the challenges presented often by the fragmented and complex payment and banking infrastructure on the continent. It's a big win for the global digital economy and just one example of private sector impact at scale. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Najmi. And now I would like to invite Ms. Reyes to speak about inclusive economies. You have the floor, Ms. Reyes. Thank you so much. I just wanted to acknowledge first my other co-convener of the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development, uh, Rosa Lizardo from the Feminist Task Force, and my colleagues in my feminist organization in Mexico, Equidad de Género, Ciudadanía, Trabajo y Familia. I'm going to speak in Spanish since that's my mother uh, language and we are in Mexico. We would love to have you here, but uh, we will we'll leave that for the next anniversary uh, celebrating our successes. Eh, pues, colegas, buenas noches y buenos días donde quiera que se encuentren. Lo que yo quería contarles ahora era el trabajo que hemos hecho en la coalición de derechos eh, y justicia económica sobre la promoción de economías eh, transformadoras e inclusivas. Este trabajo lo hemos hecho eh, pensando que no hay, no hay país, no hay región en el mundo que pueda en realidad enfrentar los retos actuales que tenemos. Y de hecho, eh, hemos pensado que es una ilusión el mandato y los últimos eh, acuerdos que solo ubican la resolución de los temas de género a nivel nacional, como si eso se pudieran resolver sin realmente atender la arquitectura financiera económica por un lado y por el otro la dimensión del subsidio que hacen las mujeres por vías de su trabajo doméstico y de cuidado no remunerado. Entonces, estas son dimensiones macroeconómicas, son dimensiones globales también, y lo que hemos visto todo este tiempo es que no hay manera de que podamos implementar todas estas medidas que hemos presentado a partir de la coalición sin verdaderamente atender también eh, la dimensión global. Y por eso tenemos tres bloques de propuestas. Eh, no las voy a leer, ustedes las van a tener, pero sí querría más bien hacer una interpretación política de ellas. La primera es precisamente la propuesta de una reforma de una arquitectura financiera y económica, donde podamos ver cuáles son los elementos que están impidiendo ampliar el piso fiscal para poder gastar en igualdad de género, en garantizar los derechos de las mujeres, en una, en una economía que también responda a las emergencias ambientales y a, a las emergencias de todo tipo. Entonces, lo que nos parece muy importante es esa dimensión, primero de ampliar la dimensión fiscal y por eso desde el Women's Working Group como movimiento estamos pensando que este espacio de las acciones de coalición es un espacio del movimiento feminista, no puede responder a las dinámicas de negociación como ocurren en la ONU, estamos esperando que tengamos un balance entre las medidas técnicas que puedan medirse, pero también con una ambición inspiradora de largo alcance y que verdaderamente responda a los sueños feministas de una economía que sirva para las personas y el planeta y no para promover el lucro o solamente para facilitar la circulación de manufacturas y de capitales. Entonces, en ese sentido, eh, la idea primero de este primer bloque de transformar la economía, la arquitectura económica, pues pasa por algunos elementos que ya aparecen en esta versión. Hay otros temas que estamos pensando y que esperamos poderle presentar hacia París, pero bueno, incluye, por ejemplo, a, ahorita lo ven ya desde un mecanismo de evaluación de los impactos tecnológicos, incluyendo las, las eh, tecnologías digitales, hay otro que está implicando también cuál es la evaluación real de los impactos socioambientales del sector privado y de las alianzas público-privadas en términos también de derechos humanos, de igualdad de género y derechos de las mujeres, eh, en fin, es una serie de elementos que estamos proyectando hacia el futuro, así como eh, todavía tenemos una, una conversación interna sobre los impactos del, del comercio en la, en la dimensión de igualdad de género. Pero en fin, eh, 
Tenemos también eh, eh, la noción de trabajar temas de deuda, así como de impuestos, no a nivel nacional, porque esto no se puede resolver a nivel nacional. Tenemos que tener unos órganos en la ONU que puedan resolver esto, un mecanismo de deuda, una convención para el tax. Eso estamos todavía discutiéndolos, pero bueno, ese, van a ser muy bienvenidas sus, sus aportes sobre esta discusión. El segundo tiene que ver con una conversación sobre las medidas de respuesta para COVID, todos los aportes apoyos y estímulos que vienen y desde ahí hemos dicho también que por ejemplo las medidas contracíclicas y de austeridad están reali en realidad aumentando las cargas de trabajo de las mujeres entonces estamos promoviendo unas medidas de respuesta mucho más in integrales que no descansen en que las mujeres de nuevo absorben todos los choques de las crisis y eh, bueno verán ustedes una, una serie de elementos que estamos recomendando en ese sentido y finalmente también a nivel nacional tan, eh, la, la dimensión eh, programática y presupuestal que como saben siempre tiene un correspondiente también normativo y entonces de qué forma se va a financiar la, las medidas de, de igualdad una vez que tengamos ampliado ese piso fiscal. No basta solo con reformar leyes, reformar programas y, y asignar presupuestos. Necesitamos ampliar el piso fiscal para gastar en esos servicios de cuidado, esos sistemas de cuidado que queremos, en esos pisos de protección social que soñamos. En fin, entonces, esto es el elemento que, que estamos buscando. Y solo les digo antes de cerrar que también eh, tenemos un proyecto político que hemos discutido con nuestras contrapartes. Se trata de a, aspirar a integrar el marco de derechos humanos de las mujeres en cada uno de los niveles. Allí vamos, hay una discusión con los con los objetivos de desarrollo eh, sustentables que, eh, como saben ustedes, rechazaron el lenguaje de derechos humanos de las mujeres, pero estamos tratando de ver que estas acciones de, eh, verdaderamente respondan a ese marco con ese espíritu que sí teníamos desde Beijing. Y bueno, finalmente eso nos parece que este es un espacio para que las feministas podamos soñar y nos da muchísimo gusto que tengamos contrapartes que se sumen a este sueño. Aquí lo dejo. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Reyes. And I would like to thank all four panelists and all speakers um, this evening, this morning for their very important and inspiring interventions. It is clear that there's much work ahead that will require commitments from all of us. I'd also like to remind all of the participants um, in this session that they can make use of the question and answer Q&A function that Venge pointed out at the beginning of the session to ask um, questions of all of our speakers, to comments, uh, to make comments, um, to uh, make any remarks that you would like on the work of um, the Action Coalition. So please do use uh, this facility. And we will have uh, time a bit later for everyone to respond to the questions raised. And I would now like to hear from all participants. Based on the interventions that you've just heard, we'd like to know which of the four areas you found most energizing by voting in the poll. So please, may we have the poll? Please select one of the following. The care economy, decent work, productive resources, inclusive economies. Please select one by clicking and in a few moments, we'll have the results on which of the uh, actions proposed you found to be the most interesting and energizing. I hope that everyone has had a chance to click and vote. May we have the results, please? Well, once again, we have the care economy in, in first place. Um, followed by inclusive economies and uh, not last, not least, by decent work and productive resources. Um, so thank you very much for that. It's just a snapshot of where we are at the moment. Um, so uh, moving on, um, I'd, we've heard how the Action Coalition intends to advance transformative actions towards economic justice and rights. And now I'd like to welcome two more leaders of the Action Coalition to hear about 
what obstacles lie in the way, but also the opportunities ahead that we can seize on. I'd like to welcome Ms. Preeti Sinha, Executive Secretary for the United Nations Capital Development Fund, UNCDF. Ms. Sinha, what obstacles and opportunities should stakeholders be paying attention to in order to realize economic justice and rights for women and girls? You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, first and foremost, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to address uh, the audience here. We wish we were in Mexico, but I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the government of Mexico, the government of France and UN Women. 75 years ago, the UN started drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UDHR. We believe at UNCDF that the Generation Equality Forum and the Economic and Justice Rights is drafting similarly a new declaration. The UDHR drafted the blueprint for a new architecture to protect fundamental human rights. And we, we believe we are here today to create those blueprints to protect and safeguard women's rights. Uh, just a note on UNCDF, we work in the least developed countries around the world, and we want to tap the untapped potential that is there in these economies. But obviously that can't happen unless we tap as well the potential of the women in those economies and all over the world. So in answer to your question, the obstacles to economic justice and rights are not distinct in, in themselves. They are intertwined with cross-cutting obstacles rooted in large financial and policy architecture, including access to finance, technology, assets, education, opportunity, which simply do not connect to girls and women at the same rate that they should. To the point, there are four cross-cutting obstacles that I would like to highlight. One, the prevailing social and cultural norms and the legal frameworks are gender discriminatory and do not address fully the needs of girls and women. Because of gender lack of gender responsive regulations, women face barriers in accessing productive resources. Their basic rights are not recognized under labor laws in some places. Unpaid care and domestic work by women uh, is not recognized or nor legally protected everywhere. And finally, in international investments, fiscal stimulus and social protection measures are not directed solely towards women. The second point, the second obstacle, the data is not disaggregated by sex and other socio-demographic variables. Without this data, we cannot identify and target the specific challenges faced by the diverse segments of women. We cannot access the number of women working in the informal sector. We cannot access gender investments submitted to the OECD DAC or track national commitments. And we cannot access women's access to financial services or determine their participation in economic life. The third obstacle, women face serious barriers in accessing technology and innovations. Women and girls are less like to, likely to access internet or own a phone, which is the most common means of personal communications and internet access in developing countries. As a result, women are denied an array of benefits that would otherwise support their economic agency. Access to online platforms for job opportunities, access to credit, access to information on their basic rights and access to support networks if they're facing abuse. Fourth obstacle, women worldwide, particularly in developing countries, lack access to affordable and reliable financial products and services. This constraint constrains the very well-being of women and their households because they are effectively blocked from entrepreneurial opportunities, healthcare and education and general participation in economic life at a high level. And when you bring in the harsh realities of COVID-19 into this architecture, the result is that 247 million women could very well be pushed back into poverty which would be an enormous setback for the cause of sustainable development. Now, from the UNCDF point of view, we deploy a set of comprehensive approaches to advance equality of all women, especially for the most disadvantaged women and female-led businesses in the least developed countries in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. 
UNCDF particularly focuses on, focuses on the local fiscal space for gender responsive economic development, increasing access to capital for women enterprises and access to digital and financial services for all women. I would like to illustrate two examples of our gender inclusive market systems approaches. The first one is called the inclusive and equitable local development. And the second one, making women builders of digital economies. First, under the inclusive and, digital, inclusive and equitable local development approach, UNCDF, along with UN Women and UNDP, has focused on building equitable local economies through three major areas, reforming policy and regulatory frameworks, investment in local infrastructure, and SME financing and technical support to boost innovative and blended finance in this last mile markets for women owned small and medium businesses. For example, in the last two year period, we leveraged an investment of about US 2.87 million in grants to unlock nearly 5 million in local resources towards investments to support women's economic empowerment. Second, at UNCDF, we aim to make women builders of the digital economy so that they can contribute to the inclusive economic development in their countries and also the well-being of their households. These key priorities include decreasing the digital divide by increasing the number of women and girls that own a phone and can access the internet and have energy sources to power that digital service. Increasing the number of affordable and digital financial products that can address the needs and challenges of the diverse segments of women. Leveraging technologies to increase access to finance and formalize women owned and managed SMEs. Supporting policymakers to use incentives and sex disaggregated data. And in this, I'd like to point out a particular example on the coalition of the amenable. This is a partnership between the public, private and civil society actors to increase the number of women in the workforce and leadership positions within the digital economy ecosystem. A perfect example is our joint call to action on reaching financial equality for women. UNCDF in partnership with the World Bank, UN Women, the UN Secretary General's Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance, Queen Maxima, the Better Than Cash Alliance and the Women's World Banking launched a global advocacy campaign with 10 recommendations to rebuild stronger after COVID-19 pandemic by prioritizing women's digital and financial inclusion. Now to come just to the four points of the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition. These all points are very crucial in addressing the constraints to women's empowerment. And by recognizing uh, these four, we would like to um, show you examples of how we believe we could uh, impact uh, these four areas at UNCDF. So first in the care economy, we want to take this invisible economy to a real economy and turn it into something we can see and acknowledge. So in particular, we believe that the focus on financing of childcare and elderly care, early childhood education and disability care facilities should be a major part of an investment strategy of any country. In the second priority, UNCDF supports um, for decent work and preparing girls and women for future work, a very stepped up approach towards investment. In this case, uh, we provide women uh, access to information about job opportunities through online platforms and increase their knowledge about their basic rights and in introduce them to professional support networks. So we really believe in uh, providing this economic uh, empowerment. In the third priority of the Action Coalition, one of the most important to UNCDF is equalizing the access to productive resources for women and girls everywhere. And we in this field, along with our partners, continue to provide and promote women-centered digital economy solutions that focus on women as builders of the digital economy and foster their well-being. The fourth priority of the Action Coalition is also critical to UNCDF in ensuring that rebuilding of the economies is gender inclusive. Larger and better targeted financing is needed to rebuild economies. We urge governments to prioritize certain financial and economic measures, funds for grassroots level organizations, social protection and financial packages to protect affected women and provide much needed relief for women owned businesses and enterprises. 
All of these actions are ambitious. They will require strong leadership and the commitments from the public sector, private sector, and civil society. That is why I'm so grateful UNCDF was selected as one of the leaders with this impressive and highly thoughtful and technical group of co-leaders. Together with our coalition partners and through the Generation Equality Forum, we will present the blueprint for a policy and financial architecture where economic justice and rights for women can be the basis of a sustainable development economy with the last mile and beyond. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Sinha, for um, outlining what the obstacles are, but also the opportunities that we have to collectively overcome them as we move ahead in this action coalition for economic justice and rights. Um, so I would now like to once again hear from all participants. And we have a new poll, a second poll, please, that we, if you, if we could put that up, please. Based on the discussion so far, are the actions presented today enough to make a difference for economic justice and rights for women and girls? So you have the choice of three answers. A, yes, the actions are adequate to bring about the desired change. B, no, the actions will not bring about the desired change. And C, this is a good start, but I have ideas on how to strengthen the actions. So please, everyone, take a moment to reflect on the interventions and to vote. Thank you. I hope everyone has had a chance to vote. May we see the results, please? Indeed, C, this is a good start, but I have ideas on how to strengthen the actions. It's great to hear that many of you feel that this is a good start towards realizing economic justice and rights for women and girls. I'd like to remind everyone that what so, has been presented so far is really a draft. So that means that we are very happy to hear that you have ideas and we invite you to join the public conversation platform uh, for the Generation Equality Forum to share those ideas with us and with everyone who is attending the forum. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Bindu Shrestha, Ms. Shrestha is the founder and chairperson of Community Women's Forum, a federation of grassroots women who manage and operate savings and credit cooperatives in Nepal. Ms. Shrestha, Shrestha's work demonstrates that grassroots women's experience on the ground with the issues that we've been speaking about today. She illustrates how women organized in collective associations can champion economic justice and rights and the importance of par partnerships in achieving women's economic empowerment at scale. May we have the video, please? Namaste, I'm Bindu Shrestha. Samdaik Maila Mons ko adeche, Wairo Commission, Asia Regional Committee ko adeche, Tatha Governing Council ko board sadeche. Samdaik Maila Mons, समुदाय में आधारित महिला सहकारी को संदाल हो इस सामुदायिक महिला मंच में समूह सहकारी करी 50 वटा संस्था अब दर्शन सदस्य 50,000 सन मने पूजी एक और बढ़ रही होता सामुदायिक महिला मंच ले समुदाय में रह का महिला आरोग्य आर्थिक तरह सामाजिक विकास को सशक्ति करने गर्नको को लाएगी विभिन्न सरकारी तरह गई सरकारी संस्था संग सहकारी कर विगत पांच वर्ष अगाडि नेपाल सरकार युवा स्वरोजगार कोष सँग सहयोग कार्य गर्दै 1 करोड 25 लाख को ऋण प्राप्त गर्न सफल भएको छ सो ऋण सहकारीका 73 जना युवा उद्यमी सदस्यहरुलाई ऋण प्रदान गरिएको थियो सो ऋण 10% ब्याज दरमा 3 वर्षमा चुक्ता गर्ने गरी सरकारले फिटा गर्ने गरी ऋण प्रदान गरिएको थियो सहकारीले 3 वर्षमा चुक्ता गरिसकेपछि 60% percent 
प्याज सरकार छूट दिए सब्सिडी प्रदान कर सामुदायिक महिला मंच अंतर्गत सहकारी नेपाल सरकारसंग सहकार उपलब्धि के रूप में लिखा नेपाल सरकार को सामाजिक सुरक्षा कोष अंतर्गत मनसंग आबद्ध कर्मचारी को सामाजिक सुरक्षा को ग्यारेटी करना को लगी नेपाल सरकारसंग एक दिन को अंतर्क्रिया कार्यक्रम करी कसरी सहकारी का कर्मचारी सामाजिक सुरक्षा कोष में आबद्ध कर सकता भूरा चाहे सरकारसंग सहकार सो कार्य अंतर्गत सहकारी का कर्मचारी को मातृत्व सुरक्षा जीवन बीमा पेन्सन लगाय सहकारी का कार्य बापट उ पाने सुविधा को बारे में सरकारसंग अंतर्क्रिया कर हमी संलग्न करना को कोशिश कर मनसंग आबद्ध धर सहकारी पूर्वाधार विस सांस्कृतिक जगेना रिप विस कार्यक्रम करना स्थानीय सरकार प्रदेश सरकारसंग सहकारी काम कर हाल साल मनसंग आबद्ध विष्णुदेवी सहकारी का सदस्य दस लाख बराबर को स्थानीय सरकारसंग सहकार करें कृषि अनुदान सदस्य कृषि अनुदान दिन को लगी पहल कर इसी सामुदायिक महिला मंच ने स्थानीय सरकार र संघीय सरकार प्रदेश सरकार ने लिया कार्यक्रम संग सहकार करते अगड़ी बढ़ी को जानकारी कराने चाहूँ धन्यवाद Uh, many thanks to Ms. Tressler for sharing her experiences, efforts, and achievements. Participants, dear participants, we're now entering a new segment of our panel discussion today, and we'll delve deeper into commitment making for the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights. I'd now like to invite uh, Ms. Hendricks from UN Women to take the floor. Ms. Hendricks, now that we've heard more about the ambitious goals and potential of the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition, how can others get involved? What does it mean to be a commitment maker for this Action Coalition? You have the floor. Thank you so much, Simi. And indeed, thank you so much to everybody for a really inspiring and substantive conversation so far. Um, I wanted to take a moment, as Simi has invited, to provide an opportunity for us to reflect together about how we can all become involved in this ambitious agenda. This agenda that will accelerate and propel progress towards this transformative feminist vision of economic justice and rights. And that term acceleration is actually very intentionally deployed. This is indeed an acceleration agenda as it reflects the intent to turbocharge implementation and drive concrete change. And so each of the actions that we have talked about already today, that all of the leaders have highlighted and that you've reflected on in these polls really address issues that are amongst the most intractable barriers to economic equality, which if implemented and fully funded can actually lead to concrete, lasting and transformative change and really help to ensure that women and girls and gender diverse people everywhere can fully enjoy their economic rights. And so now is the time um, here in the Mexico Forum for more actors to join this critical movement on the Generation Equality Action Coalitions. And so what are the next steps? How can you become involved? I'd love to invite a slide that provides a little bit more detail on that. And indeed, to realize this bold and transformative vision on economic justice and rights, the Action Coalition will require commitments that are likewise bold, that are likewise game-changing, that are likewise transformative and also multi-stakeholder in orientation. And this will be done by expanding the scope of who is engaged. And so we would like to invite a large breadth of actors to join as commitment makers into this effort. So what will commitment makers do? Commitment makers essentially will make bold and transformative commitments to one or several 
of the actions that you've heard about today on economic justice and rights. Commitment makers will also play a really critical and catalytic role in supporting the implementation as well as the monitoring, the measurement, the amplification of results over the coming years. And commitment makers will also utilize their voice, their energy to engage others, to draw forward other stakeholders around this bold vision of the Action Coalition blueprint on economic justice and rights. And the invitation to become a commitment maker is open to everyone, to women's and fem feminist organizations, to civil society actors, to youth-led organizations, to governments from the global north and south, to private sector entities, to philanthropic organizations, to UN agencies, as well as international or regional organizations, to international financial institutions, as well as others, the media, local governments, urban center governments. We are hearing from many actors who are saying we want to become involved. And so what is expected of a commitment maker? The essence is to make a commitment and to be part of this dynamic community of practice. Commitments can be multifaceted. There could be a financial commitment to drive forward and propel one of the actions that you've heard about today. An advocacy commitment to realize the ambition, for example, of achieving a care economy that works for everyone. Programmatic commitments or even um, policy and advocacy commitments that join together the voices of others to enhance and achieve change. Commitments should ideally be game changing. They should be transformative and bold in their vision, but yet also measurable and ideally designed with other stakeholders. The uniqueness of this platform of the Generation Equality Action Coalitions is that it is multi-stakeholder in orientation. And so we look to commitment makers to join hands with others. And we are hearing about that already happening. A commitment maker from a philanthropic entity joining together with private sector, joining together with government, as well as with civil society to advance a clear and targeted commitment to tackle a concrete action and bring it to life. Intersectionality, feminist leadership and transformation are also principles that underpin how the Action Coalition operates and also what they aim to achieve. And so all Action Coalition leaders and commitment makers are encouraged to reflect those principles within the design of commitments, but also commitments not uh, that are just out there but commitments that are also brought home as well within your own organizations, within your own institutions, governments, and companies. This is how real transformation will be achieved, will be driven forward. I'd like to emphasize that commitment makers will play a catalytic role in the success of the Action Coalitions by joining a dynamic community of practice to make groundbreaking change and contribute to the finalization of this vision and join hands in the implementation and monitoring of this exciting acceleration plan. There is a application platform for becoming a commitment maker that has been launched and we'd encourage you to go to the Generation Equality Forum website in order to um, signal your interest and engage a catalog of commitments aligned with the blueprint that has been shared today will support stakeholders in designing strong commitments, as I said, ideally in partnership with others. And today's blueprint, all of the actions that you've heard about on economic justice will indeed be further shaped by inputs from today's polls, from the networking sessions that took place earlier, as well as our dialogue together alongside other opportunities that are forthcoming. Today's blueprint document is available in the exhibit hall as well as online. And we look forward to your inputs to further shape this 
through the Generation Equality Public Conversation Platform. As we're heading towards the launch of the Action Coalitions in Paris, where there will be a spotlight in commitments, we encourage all stakeholders to be bold, um, to drive forward and be creative, to bring out of the box thinking that fundamentally challenges the, the, the constraints that are facing women and girls' economic lives. And in so doing, we will together enable the achievement of a world where the vision of this action coalition is realized, a world where economic justice and rights are realized for women and girls everywhere. Thanks so much. And back over to you, Simi. Thank you very much, Ms. Hendricks, for showing us the multiple and collaborative ways that all of us can become commitment weight makers and participate in the exciting next step in this Action Coalition journey. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Laura Huertas Thompson, the president of ANYAR, a youth organization in Panama. Ms. Huertas, how can we ensure that we don't fall short on the vision of the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition? May we have the video, please? Docus nua de mi mutiquipa, bablo quinan nukin, al nuga laura de vinidili huertas thompson, andigan tiki neco e burguinedi. Muy buenas noches a todos los delegados internacionales, sociedad civil, colegas líderes de la coalición de acción. Primeramente, les saludo desde mi idioma materno, que es el dulegaya, agradeciendo a la baba inana por la vida. Al igual, agradezco por la oportunidad brindada en este panel internacional. Es un momento emocionante y me siento honrada de formar parte de este equipo. Sin embargo, este evento y de hecho cada coalición de acción nos muestra la falta de avances y es decepcionante que no contemos con avances significativos al pasar de los años. Y es que han pasado 25 años desde que se le hicieron promesas ambiciosas a las mujeres y a las niñas en Beijing. 25 años de lentos avances y de a veces regresivos para nosotras, 25 años de no alcanzar el cambio necesario para observar verdaderos resultados para las mujeres y para las niñas en toda su diversidad y en el mundo. Para muchas de nosotros como jóvenes, estos 25 años equivalen nuestra vida. Y las organizaciones juveniles que formamos parte de este proceso de la generación de igualdad somos la prueba de que se pueden hacer cambios cualitativos si existiera voluntad. Sin embargo, aquí nos encontramos heredando lentamente un mundo en el que el sistema económico no funciona para nosotras las mujeres y las niñas. La participación y el liderazgo igualitario de las mujeres en la economía, igualdad de oportunidades para todos y el cumplimiento de los derechos económicos de las mujeres siguen siendo solo promesas y buenas intenciones. Las mujeres de todo el mundo seguimos dedicando el triple del tiempo que los hombres a los cuidados no remunerados y al trabajo doméstico. A su vez, siguen subvencionando toda la economía. Esta cifra es más caótica con el COVID-19, ya que la carga de los cuidados de las mujeres han aumentado en un 30 a 40 por ciento más del comienzo de la pandemia. La brecha de la participación de las mujeres en la fuerza laboral sigue siendo del 31% y se ha estancado en los últimos 20 años. No es de extrañar, pues 740 millones de mujeres en el mundo trabajan en la economía informal, donde experimentan inseguridad laboral, bajos ingresos y duras condiciones de trabajo. Eso sin hablar de las miles de mujeres que están desempleadas. Durante la pandemia, los empleos de las mujeres han sido 1,8 veces más vulnerables a la crisis del COVID que a los hombres. Las limitaciones a la justicia económica y a los derechos comienzan incluso antes de que la mujer esté en edad de trabajar, ya que muchas niñas realizan trabajos no remunerados y reciben una educación de menor calidad. 
las mujeres jóvenes entre 15 y 29 años de edad tienen tres veces más probabilidad de estar fuera de la fuerza de trabajo y de no asistir a la escuela que los hombres jóvenes. Mientras que el 71% de la población mundial carece de acceso a la protección social, las mujeres nos encontramos especialmente desfavorecidas en el sistema de protección social, experimentando tasas de cobertura más bajas y niveles de prestaciones sustancialmente menores. Esta realidad es interminable. Estimadas colegas, líderes, estados, sectores privados, el momento de cambiar es ahora. De esto se trata la generación de la igualdad. Nosotros como Coalición de Acción por la Justicia y los Derechos Económicos y como líder indígena juvenil, no, no vemos otra opción que acelerar los compromisos adquiridos en los próximos cinco años y desarrollar instrumentos vinculantes que sean objeto de mediciones. Sin embargo, no podemos hacerlo solo. Las ambiciosas acciones que han oído hablar el día de hoy no avanzarán sin acciones colectivas de organizaciones, sociedad civil, movimientos feministas, los gobiernos, sector privado, organizaciones internacionales y cada individuo. Solo cuando combinemos nuestros diversos talentos, experiencias y capacidades podemos materializar las acciones impulsando las inversiones y obteniendo resultados medibles. Les pido que reflexionemos. ¿Es el mundo de hoy el que quieren dentro de cinco años? Si su respuesta es negativa, les insto a que se comprometan a hacer realidad la justicia económica de los derechos de las mujeres y de las niñas hoy mismo. Seamos audaces. Y es que tenemos la oportunidad de única de decidir y de cambiar el mundo. Cuando consideres estos compromisos, piensa en el ámbito de las posibilidades de transformar la vida de las mujeres y las niñas. Soy optimista en cuanto al potencial de la coalición de acción. Y es que cada una de estas personas que se encuentran presentes en esta sala pueden y podrán contribuir a un cambio positivo en la justicia económica de los derechos de las mujeres y las niñas. El reto que dejo hoy con ustedes y conmigo es que no nos reunamos nuevamente dentro de cinco años fallándole una vez más a las mujeres y a las niñas del mundo. Docus Nue. Thank you so much, Ms. Huertas, for that inspiring call to action. I look forward to the day in five years time when we can look back and see real transformation and progress with the actions that we have discussed today. We would now like to take a few minutes to respond to some of the questions that have come in. As mentioned previously, we'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as possible. And I'd like to invite all of the panelists to please join me for this session. What I'd like to do is to um, go through some of the questions, um, and most of them have been directed to particular speakers or panelists. I'll read through them so that you have time to reflect on your answers and responses, and then I'll call upon you to respond. If that's okay, let's do that, please. So um, the first question is for Ms. Uh, Kachamba of FEMNET. The question is, thank you for presenting the Action Coalition Blueprint on Econo Economic Justice and Rights. How can this blueprint address the issues on intersectionality, particularly sex, age, and disability, and the continuing and accumulating gender inequalities across the life course? That's for Ms. Kachamba. Then I have a question for Ms. Hendricks. How does this Action Coalition participation lead to invitation to the Paris event for participants? Will there be efforts to localize or build on the national and regional levels of the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights? 
And where do we post our action coalition commitments? Then a question, actually two questions for Ms. Mungare. First, are there actions that can uh, recommend to all of us to build peace in favor of women, noting that Mexico has the highest rate of femicides? And the second question for Ms. Mungare is, many women continue to engage in unpaid and paid work into old age, and the vast majority work in the informal economy with limited uh, social protection, and they are often overlooked. How can we ensure that they are included and benefit from efforts um, for the economic empowerment of women and improving gender equality? A question for Ms. Sinha. Within the coalition, have you reflected on the way in which um, the data on uh, economic um, occupation to uh, present exploitation such as sexual exploitation in prostitution or informal e economic activities um, as part of increased income for families in our countries. And um, finally, a question for Ms. Spreckman. Um, how does the Action Coalition aim to reverse gender hostile politics in this area? What instruments are available to oblige states or enterprises to implement gender sensitive policies? So um, I'd like to turn first um, to Ms. Kachamba of FEMNET to answer the questions on the blueprint of the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights and about addressing the issues on intersectionality, um, particularly sex, age, and disability and gender inequalities across the life course. Ms. Kachamba, the floor is yours. Please um, take no more than two minutes for your answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think, uh... I think just to start is to say, when we look at the four actions, the first one, when we look at issues that have to do with um, unpaid care work and domestic work, it's important to also note that some of the realities is that most of them, you find a lot of young people who are involved, girls who are involved in, in unpaid care work. And I did see a comment which was also talking about issues to do with age, that older women also continue with unpaid care work. So in this section coalition, we are really taking particular uh, looking at these intersectional issues and really trying to understand what is the intersection um, as a concept to say, when we look at the realities of the four actions, how does this affect the young girls? How does this affect issues of women with disabilities? So for example, in the care economy, um, what sort of services and financing are needed to lessen the burden of women and people living with disabilities? How do we make sure that investments and infrastructure are going towards that? When we look at the action on, on decent work as well, women with disabilities, women of color, migrant workers. Um, it's also to look women in informal, uh, in the informal economy. So when we go deeper into the blueprint, it's to actually identify as well as to ensure that the lived realities of women who are not a homogeneous group are recognized in each of the four actions that we are proposing and that there's, um, there is emphasis in terms of the taxes which where we're talking about making sure the policies are reformed to reflect um, this intersectionality. And I think just to emphasize that um, it's also important to, to look at some of the cultural norms and to also to understand how the different, even the different histories, for example, um, economies that have been affected by colonialism, uh, economies that are also largely affected by the neoliberal 
and the whole capitalist financial system, how are these um, impacted in differently, the global and South uh, politics. So all these are integrated within the four actions that are being proposed um, within the blueprint. Thanks, Simon. Thanks so much, um, Ms. Kachamba. And now I would like to uh, invite Ms. Hendricks to respond to the questions about um, Paris, uh, about uh, localizing um, uh, the Action Coalition and um, about posting Action Coalition commitments. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. And indeed, thank you for all these questions. Um, great to see the energy and um, curiosity uh, about becoming involved and already thinking towards Paris and uh, how to engage there. Um, indeed, the question about how will the Action Coalition decide on invitations to the Paris event? The um, Paris event is being planned right now, and the aim is to take the same approach to the Mexico City Forum to ensure that participation um, is as open as a uh, virtual platform can allow. Um, I understand that this platform reached at least 10,000 participants over the last couple of days. Um, and will ensure that there is dynamic representation from all sectors um, and from, from all um, uh, people as well as uh, governments, organizations, institutions, companies, philanthropies, um, activists, women's rights organizations, as well as youth-led organizations. And so the same principles um, will apply to ensure that the Paris Forum is indeed highly dynamic and represents in practice a commitment to an intersectional lens in participation itself. Um, in terms of efforts to localize or build a national or regional level effort, um, I absolutely love your question because this is exactly what we would like to see happen. And indeed, it's what we're already seeing starting to take place. In fact, as I understand it, um, there are some local governments as well as regional efforts that are afoot to take some of the vision in the blueprint on economic justice and rights and to think about what a regional and or a local government um, design to actualize uh, the vision in the blueprint could mean. Um, and to acknowledge that as a commitment in and of itself with the stakeholders that would be involved in that localization effort. Localizing the um, blueprints is where our energy needs to go. And uh, it is only through the localization of our efforts that we will be able to drive real substantive and concrete change. And so we encourage you to think about driving and building a commitment that reflects a local and or regional approach. And that leads to the third question. Where do we post our action coalition commitments? We will put on the chat um, the, uh, the hyperlink uh, to the platform where you will be able to go and signal your interest to become a commitment maker and where further um, guidance will be provided uh, on uh, advancing your submission to become a commitment maker as well as um, eventually when you have a clear commitment to make where you can register that commitment so that it's um, not just duly acknowledged, but that it's also being amplified in the Paris Forum. Thanks, and back over to you, Simi. Uh, thank you so much for those informative and um, to the point answers. Um, now we'd like to um, turn to Ms. Mungarai for answers to the questions about building peace in the context of femicides, and um, about uh, um, uh, women's continued engagement with unpaid and paid work into old age um, in the informal economy without social protection, what are the measures that we can take to ensure their economic rights and justice? Ms. Mungarai, the floor is yours and please um, limit your answers to two minutes. Thank you. 
you. Uh, en este, el desarrollo económico debe responder a las necesidades de las mujeres. Eh, tendría que garantizar el pleno acceso a sus derechos económicos y por tanto la autonomía económica de las mujeres debería ser la capacidad para decidir su, sobre sus cuerpos y sus vidas. Y esto es fundamental para construir una sociedad donde las relaciones de poder se nivelen entre mujeres y hombres. También la justicia económica genera un efecto dominó que permite que mejoren los mercados laborales y las oportunidades para las mujeres y los hombres. Impulsar la igualdad para todas y todos es el primer paso para construir una sociedad más equitativa, sostenible y por supuesto pacífica. En este sentido, el gobierno de México basa todas sus acciones de política pública poniendo de entrada eh, como la, las poblaciones más importantes son las que son eh, más, más, las que más lo necesitan, son las más importantes para el gobierno de México porque se está buscando combatir la desigualdad, lo cual tiene un potencial al darle la, la autonomía económica a las mujeres para poder reducir la crisis de feminicidios que vivimos en México, como bien lo mencionó esta mañana el presidente de México. Eh, eh, y y otro punto que es muy importante que caracteriza al gobierno de México es el combate a la corrupción y la cero tolerancia a la impunidad, premisa de política pública que es esencial para impulsar la paz y reducir los feminicidios en el país. Para la segunda pregunta sobre eh, el trabajo de las mujeres, en la Secretaría de Economía tenemos como prioridad el impulso de los negocios de las mujeres, especialmente los negocios más pequeños las microempresas que eh, representan eh, el 75% del empleo de este país y el 99% de los negocios y donde hay una gran concentración de mujeres en este tipo de negocios. ¿Y cómo lo hacemos? A través del de financiamiento y la capacitación para las mujeres que están buscando eh, crecer sus negocios y que están buscando desarrollar habilidades eh, empresariales y habilidades socioemocionales que son también muy importantes para que estos negocios puedan crecer. Viéndolo como un, una, una cosa redonda, la autonomía económica de las mujeres es fundamental para que ellas puedan tomar eh, las riendas eh, en sus hogares, en sus vidas y esta autonomía se, se debe hacer a partir de una política pública incluyente que les dé estas capacidades que necesitan para poder eh, tener una vida económica eh, activa y que les beneficie. Thank you so much, Dr. Bungaray. And now I'd like to turn to Ms. Sinha, please, for the question about um, how uh, the Action Coalition is dealing with economic uh, or income generating activities um, related to sexual exploitation in prostitution or in informal ac economic activities. Thank you, Simon. And I'd like to take a moment to introduce Nandini Harish Harishwara, who is our uh, focal point from UNCDF for the uh, Generation Equality Forum. Nandini, you will answer on my behalf. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the question. Um, our, there is a huge focus on uh, the underlying need for sex disaggregated data the collection and appropriate usage of sex disaggregated data to improve policymaking as well as private sector uh, access and uh, um, availability of appropriate financial and digital services for women across the world. It's very, very important to be very intentional as we uh, have this as a focus in almost every blueprint uh, of having sex disaggregated data be collected across the spectrum in order to improve uh, women's uh, access to economic justice and rights. Um, the question at hand really forces us to uh, in emphasize that intentionality and the importance of carefully constructing the mandate 
and the actual collection and usage of sex disaggregated data to help women move from informal to formal sectors, to help women have increased access to digital fin and financial services, to help women have uh, be counted uh, uh, because as of now, they're part of this kind of invisible economy. Um, many of the, much of the work that we do focuses uh, on SME financing, insurance, ensuring decent work conditions through better policies, work environment, and safety from sexual harassment. In our municipal projects with local government, we have included provisions such as police checks to make sure women farmers are able to trade their products in a safe environment. And our Women's Economic Empowerment Index is used to ensure viable projects include specific criteria on women's leadership, safety, and better working conditions and others. So we work at UNCDF with our partners, you see here and elsewhere, to ensure that sex disaggregated data is a key component in our partners' work and our work to try to create more equality uh, for women in digital and financial services. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to turn to uh, Ms. Spreckman to answer the question about um, how to reverse gender hostile po policies and um, what instruments are available for states and, and, and enterpri enterprises to implement gender sensitive policies. Ms. Spreckman. Thank you, thank you for that question. Um, it is the tools um, such as the examples I mentioned earlier, for example, the ILO Convention 190 on prevention of harassment in, in, in the workplace and, and, and violence in the workplace, or earlier the ILO Convention 189 on the rights of domestic workers. Those are actually concrete tools that uh, for which we must push um, so that we precisely have those policy means um, in order to, to pressure governments and, and, and policymakers. So I think it's really critical to work on that front. And, uh, and that's why that is also a priority for the Action Coalition. So um, of course, those tools alone will not transform reality when we have to apply them, we have to make sure they're put in practice, but also those tools actually help shape also social norms once once implemented and 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 I think I've I've seen that over the last years with the ratification and in many countries of ILO Convention 189 where we have a long way to go for the rights of domestic workers, but um, you know when we compare where many of those workers there were countries in Latin America for example that had two uh, labor codes one for all other type of work and one for domestic work, which allowed exploitation, which didn't allow domestic workers to have the right of, 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 of vacation, of um, an eight hour day. All of that was consistently violated. So I think that interaction between the policies that help us shape then uh, the change and, 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 and how that influences so, uh, social norms is essential. Another, I think, important area is actually, and I think um, that's an important proposal, is that at the multilateral level, there's also the opportunity for critical policy tools and change. For example, that multilateral fund for social protection, which could be uh, financed by both aid and tax, is, is, is one I would be very excited about and CARE would be very excited about because we really need um, policy solutions that will guarantee a safety net and social protection for all women, especially those in the informal sector. Thank you so much. And we have time for two more questions. Um, very quick responses, I'm afraid, um, would be required. But the first question of the two that ha are, are, have just come up is for um, Ms. Reyes. The question is, in our countries, there are initiatives from the solidarity or exchange economy. How can these initiatives be supported and strengthened um, to uh, uh, 
to achieve an economic system that includes and cares for planet and the humanity. Um, please, if you would limit your uh, answer to two minutes, Ms. Reyes. Thank you so much. I'm gonna speak in English. Now I heard that there was a problem with my interpretation uh, back when I was giving my intervention. It's too sad because I was giving the key to happiness, love and success, but uh, you will have to hear the review uh, afterwards. Uh, but I want to say that in the in this action coalition, we're trying to to make a package. Not one single point of entry is going to be enough. It's like the full vision that is really ambitious. And we, as you've seen, we haven't finished yet. But it's really what are the elements that we need. And in the case of the of of this type of of social and solidarity economies, it's very important because it emphasizes what happens at the local level and we still need to promote micro to micro uh, dialogue to hear what is functioning not only in that particular setting but really what can be replicated elsewhere or uh, in another dimension that I'm very interested in is because you know the macro is the aggregation of the micro what are the key solutions at the local level that can really enhance our, our vision that the, this new this economy that we want the feminist economy that prioritizes people of, and the planet over the profits how can we really respect those dynamics I don't think necessarily that all of the local practices need to be scalable precisely because the the ambition to scale everything has led us to this predatory extractivist notion and uh, I think at the local level, this type of practices is crucial. And uh, if you mainstream the care economy into these local practices, that can be massive. Uh, I'm also going to add that there is a need for a just transition, uh, not only of the of the workforce, but really thinking about energetically and a, a new way to produce and to consume. How does that relate as well with the new, uh, to abolish the sexual division of labor and on the other hand, to promote room for everybody to fulfill their, their human rights. So that's a, a challenge. But I think those are tackled with, with a package of, of measures. But I really look forward to have the, that type of dialogue and that type of measures being implemented in the next five years, because this is the type of solutions we need. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Reyes. And a final question, please, directed to Ms. Um, Najmi. Um, according to your point of view, what are the priority actions to tackle the high unemployment of women that was exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis? Women have seen their income drastically reduced. Even informal activities have been seriously affected. Gender violence rages um, and Afro-descendant and indigenous women are particularly affected. What kind of economy do we need to overcome this and to achieve equality and quality of life as human me as human beings? Ms. Najmi. Absolutely. I'll give four quick thoughts. One is on childcare, thinking of it as um, a type of economic infrastructure that all stakeholders have to invest in. Um, the employer as well as government, um, as well as the broader um, economies ecosystem. The second, I would say, is there's an opportunity for all economies to learn from the gig economy in terms of thinking differently about the units of time um, that are spent. So for example, when you think about women, they might not be able to work continuous eight hours. They might need breaks to do pumping for milk or to be able to have interjections of childcare. And that flexibility is critical. They might be able to work between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. and then again from 8 p.m. to 12 p.m. and thinking about how can you still employ that person at the hours they're available and that fits their life and broader responsibilities. A third is thinking differently about one person having one job and instead thinking about what opportunities of job sharing are there where multiple people fill one role or how one person can actually have a portfolio of jobs. And so I think Really, we have to rethink about the traditional form of a job, how many can people could fill one role, which hours the, the work is actually done, 
um, as well as truly just investing in childcare as economic infrastructure. Thank you so much. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the participants for their insightful questions and the panelists and speakers for their very deep and profound answers. Thanks to all. And now I would like to um, hand back to our MC, Venge. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Simi, for the fantastic moderation of today's panels. As always, it's such a pleasure to work with you. Dear participants, we've now learned a great deal about the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights, and I'm sure you are as inspired as, and energized as I am to contribute towards the realization of economic justice and rights for women and girls. Thank you again, Simi, and our wonderful Action Coalition leaders for such a great session. Dear participants, so what next? Where are we taking the Action Coalition to? I'd like to ask Sarah Hendricks to turn your camera on and help us answer this question. Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Venge, and indeed to all the amazing panelists for today's really robust, substantive conversation. So what comes next? Um, we have shared with you this draft acceleration plan, this draft blueprint comprising these four catalytic actions on economic justice and rights. And as I mentioned, uh, this is indeed a draft and that's intentional. And so there is an opportunity for voices to contribute to shaping this effort further. And to do so, we would encourage you to become involved, to join what we call the Action Coalition Generation Equality Public Conversation Platform, um, to contribute your voice and to continue to shape this blueprint further. In addition, there is a critical opportunity before us to ensure that um, each of us becomes involved, as I mentioned earlier, by becoming a commitment maker. As we march towards the Paris Forum, the focus will be indeed in Paris in spotlighting and amplifying the bold commitments that will realize the vision set out in the economic justice and rights blueprint. And so I would encourage all of you to look at this kickoff today in Mexico as a kickoff and a mobilization moment towards driving commitments that will then propel the launch in Paris forward. The vision that has been set out by the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition is indeed bold and ambitious. It seeks to ensure that economic justice and rights are guaranteed for women and girls in all their diversity to drive systems and structures to be gender responsive and ensure equitable, secure access to resources, services, and decision-making, mm -hmm. to look at gender transformative enterprise and trade, the promotion of non-discriminatory labor markets, free of violence and harassment, a care economy that equitably shares and values care and domestic work and resilience to economic shocks. And then it also has a vision about strengthening accountability through gender responsive laws, policy, as well as data and statistics. We've captured today's conversation in a dynamic illustration and we'll look forward to also sharing that with you. And so allow me to close before handing back over to Venge with again a um, highlight on the importance and the opportunity to spotlight commitments as we drive towards Paris three months hence. The opportunity to build and to realize this vision stands, I think, on the shoulders of all of us. The ability for us to expand and bring creativity out of the box thinking, as well as concrete and resourced commitments together as stakeholders will be what it takes to achieve the vision of economic justice and rights. And with this, I pass back over to you, Venge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Your and Hannah's leadership has been an honor 
for me and others. And we look forward to more in the coming uh, months as we head towards Paris. Thank you. Dear participants, we're now at the end of our program today. What a great audience you've all been. Thank you for your patience and curiosity to listen to our great panel today. I take this opportunity to also thank the invisible support that we've had to make today happen. Our interpreters, the team from the Difference Consulting who have helped to facilitate this meeting, our tech crew, the government of Mexico for hosting us. I just want to applaud you all and I give you my thanks uh, on behalf of the Action Coalition Secretariat and the entire Generation Equality Forum team. I look forward to seeing you all and more in Paris. Good night and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>